15 years ago, we graduated from Stanford Business School. And at the time, I had no job, I had really no plan to make an impact on the world. And my view of success was, was frankly linear. You work hard and good things happen. As I stand here today, 15 years later, I have no job, <laughs> a relatively loose plan for how I'd like to make an impact on the world. But I think I've gained a much more nuanced view of the path to success, in that it's nonlinear, full of twists and turns, and unexpected successes and failures. And I think Mike Tyson said it best when he said, we all have a plan until we get punched in the face. <laughs> and I think we've all been punched in the face a lot over the last 15 years. And it's really those experiences at least give me the confidence that the next 15 years are going to be amazing in our professional pursuits. So I thought about what have I learned over the last 15 years that prepare me for the next leg of the journey. And I really boiled it down to four lessons which I think I didn't learn at Stanford and I hope uh, resonate with all of you today. So the first lesson is really about loving failure. It's a term we didn't talk a lot about at Stanford, but in Silicon Valley we talk about failing fast. And after graduating, I definitely failed fast. Not only did I have no job, but my first job nine months after school didn't pay me. I failed to convince them to pay me. And that company was Friendster, the predecessor of Facebook, and it also failed. Um, a couple years later, I started a nightclub called Slide. Hope many of you had a good time there. <laughs> we raised $2 million of outside capital. That company went bankrupt. A couple years later, I started with a co-founder of mine, a company called Lotus Vodka. Did anyone drink Lotus last night at LPF? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lotus Vodka raised $3 million of outside capital and went bankrupt. Eventually, I learned that maybe the software business was a better business than the alcohol business. Uh, a few years later, I started a company called Retargeter. I was very proud we got to $10 million in revenue. We raised $3 million of outside capital. Can you guess what happened? <laughs> it went bankrupt. <laughs> um, but the failing, you know, didn't always stop there because eventually I started a company that did work. It was called Bright Roll. Um, and we got to a point in our trajectory where it was very unclear what the outcome would be. We really were not going to go public and we really needed to have, find an acquisition, but it was going to be a tough pass. And we were in a process with AOL. The process was going okay. And then I woke up three months later and I read in the paper, AOL had actually bought our direct competitor, unbeknownst to me, in the process. It was a dark day. Not only a failed process, but Really a moment where I said, wow, I'm running out of options here for this company. Uh, frankly, it paired in comparison to a year later when I was in an M&A process with Facebook, and I woke up to Facebook bought our other direct <laughs> At the time, all of these moments were really failure moments and challenging moments. But I think that they have given me the strength to look out over the next 15 years to be able to overcome challenges. I didn't know it at the time, but this Facebook process ended up being the catalyst that resulted in Yahoo acquiring our company. The second lesson I've learned is really about getting lucky. Uh, and I'm not just talking about blind luck. So I'm now the first to admit it, I probably wasn't when I was in business school, that I won what Warren Buffett called the, the Lucky Sperm Club. Mm -hmm. I was born as a white male in Palo Alto, California to two Stanford-educated parents. I also had incredible curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> about blind luck. I'm talking about luck that you have an involvement in, whether it's direct or indirect. So when I attended here with my girlfriend and now wife Rebecca, um, we talk a lot now about our three children, you know, our two daughters and the company that was started as part of our relationship. Uh, she was integrally involved in the decision to leave and pursue it uh, and all the dark days that, that came. And I feel incredibly lucky about uh, the success we've had in our relationship together. Similarly, on the business side, my co-founder, in retrospect, I barely knew him, right? I did my best to vet it, but there was tremendous amount of luck that that relationship ended up working out so well and that we were able to complement uh, each other uh, throughout that process. Uh, and then there's business luck, timing luck. So when I finally received a call three months after that Facebook process uh, from Yahoo and they expressed interest in acquiring company, the context was really once in a generation. They owned $50 billion of stock in Alibaba. They had made $10 billion in the Alibaba IPO. The plan for the company was to acquire their way out of losing to Facebook and Google with a long string of acquisitions. Um, the long story short is they made one acquisition. It was Bright Roll, which was my company. 
activist investors essentially shut down the initiative and it was eventually sold to Yahoo. I mean, sold to Verizon, excuse me. And I sort of described this process, I don't know if you remember this scene. Jones <laughs> <laughs> and the Temple of Doom when he grabs the icon and runs. <laughs> the building is crumbling, the bridges are falling, and he emerges. So I have the humility to say I could be standing here today, the company not sold, very unclear what our options were, uh, and I know we benefited from tremendous luck in that all working out. The third lesson I learned was really about having regrets. If you remember in Irv Grosbeck's last lecture, he said, it's regrets for the things that we've done that temper with time. It's the regrets for the things that we haven't done that are inconsolable. So I have some regrets. <laughs> I probably wear too many costumes and party too much while I was in business school. Um, but seriously, I spent six months at business school writing a book about how to use Google that I planned to sell for $1.99 when 2003 would have been a great time to join the company. <laughs> a few years later, I started buying domains, and I worked hard to buy Facebook.com with one O. 2005 would have been a great time to join the company. Uh, but in all seriousness, I cursed that I had started a company in the advertising business many times because it was very, very competitive, had some serious uh, dirty practices, uh, and I always questioned what was the social value of what we were doing. Um, so that really challenged me throughout the entire journey. And of course, I burned, as I mentioned, a lot of third-party capital. Uh, and I definitely regret some of those decisions, many of whom, whom were friends and family. Whoever saw it is, I apologize for notice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for investing. <laughs> standing here in 15 years, these are the type of regrets I hope I have, which I was on the field, I was trying to innovate, I may have failed, uh, but I gave it my all. Uh, and the last lesson I've learned is really about being thankful. And if you end up going through a situation where you sell a business, particularly one that involves a lot of capital, uh, it's very clear to me in retrospect that essentially nobody knows how to behave. And that includes investors who sort of do this all the time as part of their daily job. Um, and we talk about being a leader of an organization as a lonely pursuit, but this process was surprisingly impersonal and cold. And if I think about our last board meeting where at the very end somebody said, it's been a pleasure serving with you. I didn't realize until that point we'd never meet again. Or the night we signed the definitive agreement and everyone went to sleep because we were all burned out. Or perhaps the day when we actually wired the money to you know, multiple dozens of people, investors and buyers as employees. And I think I had maybe two meaningful conversations that day. In my dreams, this was like, they put you on your shoulders and you run off the field, <laughs> right? Uh, and that wasn't really how it felt. I think this is one of those moments where we as leaders have an opportunity to lead by example. And that is, of course, you're going to thank your employees for their contributions. But what about their spouses, right? What about your customers? What about your vendors, your friends, your investors, advisors, people who helped you on that journey? That's what brings up those meaningful conversations. And it's not just about being a, a gracious winner. You know, I think that these are the moments where you might want to gloat to the competitor that you sort of beat in the market, or the employee who turned you down to pursue another opportunity, or the investor who passed on your investment. Uh, and for me, it was reaching out, being thankful, finding a way to appreciate all those people who had contributed to your process that frankly brought meaning uh, to that experience. And if I did it all again, I would have reached out more and even been more thankful in those moments. So here we are at our 15-year reunion, uh, thinking about you know, changing lives, changing organizations, and changing the world. And so I have a wish for, frankly, all of us. Uh, and that wish is that we get lucky, that we have regrets, the right kind of regrets. Um, and I'm forgetting my first one. Oh, and we fail. It's <laughs> like that. And that when it all works out or we have some forms of success, we'd be thankful in those moments. Because for me, that's made all the difference. Thank you.